Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ashley. And thank you um, for um, um, so much for everybody coming out today. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully um, I'll get I'll get it right. <laughs> All right. And so we want to launch this puppy slideshow. All right. Okay, today we are going to um, uh, talk about why uh, fruit set isn't perfect in cherry and pear. And Ashley, we may have a visitor coming in. I have a, a Mason bee producer who um, uh, I might, if he shows up, Jim Watts is his name. And so he may uh, join us during the meeting. And if he does, I uh, uh, promote him to a co-host and he'll um, have a few things to say about Mason bees and cherries. Okay, and Chris, uh, it, as always, Chris has a lot of experience working in uh, pollination systems uh, uh, in Michigan. So Chris, just pipe in at any uh, time. Uh, just to mention, uh, next week, there's gonna be another session that focuses a lot more closely on the work that um, Chris and I are doing in terms of uh, habitat restoration in and around orchard crops. So stay tuned for next Thursday. I want to cover four things today, uh, really focusing on the first three, uh, why pollination falls short. The first one is pollen is incompatible. The second is the pollen doesn't move. Um, the third is that the flower times out. And the fourth, um, I'm just going to touch briefly on some pest management issues, but um, I'm really going to gloss that. So let's talk about why pollen isn't compatible. So here we go uh, in sweet cherry. You've got it's perfectly it's at the perfect stage. Um, the duration in the middle here we have the stigma. That's the platform that collects the pollen, and the pollen germinates and tunnels its way down. The duration of the receptivity of that stigma can be up to nine days when it's nice and cool out. But as soon as it blasts hot, like it did last year, um, that can shrink to just a couple days. And we're going to address this issue of. Um, keeping flowers fresh in the third part uh, or third objective today. But this is the name of the game. It's the, uh, we're gonna have uh, three things have to come together for pollination. The stigma needs to be receptive. The pollen tubes uh, need to be in the right condition to extend down the style. And uh, the ovule has to survive until pollination. And um, there's all sorts of problems that can go, uh, go on in this process so that you don't get uh, uh, fruit set. Um, and so let's, we'll cover that today. The first thing is pollen incompatibility. In cherry, um, the ability of um, pollen to actually germinate, go and finish this whole uh, fertilization process is dependent on an, uh, a gene that has a multiple alleles, um, this S allele. Uh, and due to inbreeding in the North American gene pool, there's only a number of these um, alleles available. So cross, uh, and this results in cross incompatibility. So you can see here, if you have the same allele, uh, if the, here you have, uh, I think this is, I can't remember what variety this is. I think these are, I think this is a Bing, uh, this is a Bing flower. If you have Bing pollen land on it, I might have that wrong. But if you have the same alleles uh, that land on the stigma, you'll, uh, you'll not get uh, uh, fertilization. But you can see here in the uh, situation where the donor is Rainier, um, you have the S1. So 50% uh, of those pollen grains coming from the pollinizer don't match S3 and S4 and will, um, pollinate, uh, will result in fertilization. Here you have a perfect compatibility, uh, full compatibility. Uh, where the pollen's coming in is these alleles as S1 and S2, and they will pollinate um, and result in um, a, a full fruit set. So this is kind of like, I guess it's kind of like the uh, game I had as a kid, Atari's Missile Command. Uh, the pollen is coming in, and somewhere in this process, there's all sorts of things being shot at those, ob uh, those uh, po uh, pollen grains that result in um, uh, fertilization not taking place. In cherry, um, there it's you know most of you know this because you have your pollinizers in your uh, 
orchards already, and you know uh, there are allele groups that pair well with um, other allele groups. And obviously the thing that breeders are looking to do increasingly is making sure that you have a universal donor. Uh, uh, these, uh, all of these varieties here are self-compatible, uh, don't require a pollinizer. The other trick in this for those of you who are new to the game is that the pollinizers, uh, ideal pollinizers don't necessarily bloom simultaneously uh, with, uh, with your, the tree that you're, with the crop that you're trying to pollinate. So you have a limited set of pollinizers that uh, will actually fit. Pear is a different issue. So um, as, and this is, I, I kind of feel like these, this is Coles to Newcastle in the first part because you all know this better than I do, but um, I had to dig back for Pear to, there's a great uh, OSU publication from 1958. Um, as you know, uh, uh, you can get uh, uh, you seedless, uh, seedless um, pears will come out um, for Anjou, Bosque, and Camas, and they're the result of self-pollinated florets. So you can get uh, fruit set uh, just fine without uh, um, pollen being transferred uh, from another, uh, um, without outcrossing. Uh, Self-pollinated bartlets yield both seed, seeded and seedless fruits, so you can get seeded uh, bartlets um, as a, from self-pollination. And what was found in this old study that was done in Hood River and down in Medford is that uh, these seedless fruit were not misshapen and their flavor, sugar, and texture and storability were the same as if you had seeded pears. But what was clear, and you can see here with Anjo, if you selfed, you got 13% of those flowers turned into fruit, whereas it got bumped up, uh, you got almost double the percentage uh, when you outcrossed and uh, even bigger bump happens with, um, with Bosque. And so uh, outcrossing doesn't necessarily lead to higher fruit quality, but it certainly leads to higher yields. Okay, now we're getting to something that I know something about. Um, bear with me on that first part. We're going to talk about why pollen isn't moving uh, from uh, throughout the orchard. So we've already made the case that outcrossing is important uh, in most of the fruit that you're growing. So why doesn't it move? There is an issue with bees not moving uh, like marbles through an orchard. They, uh, they forge in very uh, particular patterns. They don't move everywhere. And you can see that exemplified in the study that was done in Hood River. Uh, Re Regina was the crop, Sam is the pollinizer. And you can see in the row where the pollinizer was. So this is the uh, tr uh, distance from the pollinizer. So this is the tree right beside the pollinizer in the pollinizer row. Uh, you can see that yield drops off as you go away from the pollinizer. You all know this, and that's why you need to um, take up valuable real estate with these pollinizers. And you can see the row over. So this is one tree over uh, on the opposite side um, uh, where the, a row that doesn't have a pollinizer, you can see that drop off right across the row. So even though these two trees are roughly the same distance from the pollinizer, the act of crossing the row uh, is something that bees don't like to do. They prefer to move right down the row. Honeybees at the very least like to do that. Again, this is this 1958 study that was done in Medford, which was, Bill Stevens was a great bee biologist. So um, I was really excited to read through this monograph. And what he did was he marked bees that were coming to three different trees, uh, pear trees, and then he came back um, later in the day and he marked 50 and later in the day, lo and behold, those of those 50 bees, 21 were seen on the exact same tree. And it came back two days later and 14 of those bees or 16 or nine, a big proportion of those bees are back on the exact same tree. Honeybees have this strange fidelity to, um, I'm not exactly sure how this works, but they have a fidelity to where they've gone. So their ability to outcross is somewhat limited. They're not just kind of like, I'm going to go a little bit here. I'm going to go a little bit there, like a butterfly would just kind of like roams the landscape. Bees have a kind of strict fidelity to where they're going, which is a, 
which is bad news in terms of tr spreading compatible pollen. Ash, I'm just gonna pause here if there are any questions. Uh, I see there is a question that came in. I'm gonna move on to another issue. It may be a, a research question. It was just a quick question about what are what are pollinate or what are pollinizer, what are pollinizer trees. So I just took the opportunity to answer that, but you can answer that for the group if you'd like, Andoni. I uh, I it, a pollinizer. So I guess this is a question for you, Ashley, since there are some people in this room that may not know this. Do you you harvest? I guess the pollinizer. It's a tree that you're really putting in the in the orchard to provide uh, compatible pollen. But do people actually harvest that? Um, yeah, people can harvest that, uh, especially in cherry. People will harvest that. In something like apple, it's a little different because often you'll have a, a very uh, a crab tree apple that or something. blooms. Yeah, a crab apple that blooms an awful lot. And cherry, you usually do harvest them. And in fact, in some situations, not to go on too long about this, people are starting to plant entire rows of, of pollinizer trees. So it's almost like an alternate row. It's not super common yet that I know, but it does happen. Okay, thanks, Ashley. That's great. And uh, and Chris, also, when these questions do come in, uh, feel free to pipe in. Okay, so um, the next reason why pollen isn't moving everywhere is because of competition. So here we have a situation, and pear is notorious for this. So pear has a very the sugar is very thin. 7 to 17 percent of the nectar which the bees are probing at the bottom of the flower to get um, uh, get out is uh, has contained sugar so it's mostly water but if you go to the things that are on the floor of your orchard chickweed is notoriously high it's almost 60 percent sugar if you have uh, competing chickweed and pear uh, there's going to be a problem and the study that was done in osu in the 50s showed that if you eliminated all the bloom on the forest floor and you looked at the pollen coming into the colony, almost 50% of the pollen was from pear. But if you had any competition, almost 70% of that pollen is coming from something else. So competition in pear is severe. And the way this works is uh, apple is the sweetest nectar. So there's bees, you, uh, this competition with the floor in apples is you know, much less. It, um, apple nectar is almost as sweet as chickweed and cherry is somewhere in the middle. And so, but pear uh, is very, is very thin. Um, this is really nicely demonstrated in this study. Uh, the first example here, we have dandelion uh, and apple, and you can see on the top, um, this is the number of, uh, this is the sweetness in the flower over the day. So you can see in the first thing in the morning, uh, the flower is starting ramping up and then it sort of hits its, you know, peak there uh, in the dandelions at 35% sugar. And you can see apple is matching it fairly well. It's just about 30%. And so if you look at the bee visitation through the day on the orchard floor, so that's, uh, um, here's the dandelion. You can see the bees like the dandelion a lot, but they're, they're on the apple blossom, even if there's competing bloom. And the reason for that is the sugar and uh, sugar concentration in the ap apple and dandelion are fairly well matched. But here's the problem in pear. Um, in this example, uh, this is from the UK, so they had wild hawthorn. And you can see here, this is the pear sugar concentration, never gets very high. The hawthorn being in the apple family kind of, you know, ramps up. And you can see where the bees are. The bees here, so you can see these are the bees on the hawthorn and very few bees going into the pear. So this is a problem uh, that you're going to encounter in pear and you all know this. And so the, this is the difference. So you can see um, this is a, a study from France. You can look at the visitation rate per hour so uh, on the uh, in the pear orchards, and it's just way lower than you'd see in an apple orchard. Um, and this is just going to be the reality of things with uh, uh, with with pear. Ashley, I see a couple questions popped up. Maybe we can take them, and then we'll move along. Yeah, sure. And I wasn't quite sure how you want to do this, but um, we have a question here. Doesn't current research suggest that the majority of pollen transfer occurs within the hive from bees rubbing against each other? 
so that eventually each forager winds up with a mix of the most of the pollen picked up by the whole colony. Therefore, it isn't Therefore, it isn't that limiting a, limiting a factor that bees don't fly in an ideal pattern to pick up pollen from one tree and move it to the next. No, that is not true. And, um, and this is where I think we're going to see some, when we talk about mason bees, where mason bees have, you know, have a role to play. Honeybees and bumblebees are curriculate bees. And what they do is they, they process the reason they're gathering pollen is of course to take back to feed the brood nest and honeybees are really meticulous at getting everything off their body and into these tight pellets on their back legs so they're essentially taking pollen out of circulation it gets tamped down into like a thick putty and when they come back to the colony they just pack that down there's not a lot of loose pollen left on a on a honeybee when it returns to the hive it's really you know, in when it's in the orchard that most of that pollen transfer is taking place. With things like um, other bee species aren't that good at kind of getting pollen kind of into into a package. And so they have, they tend to have a lot of more loose pollen on their bodies, but honeybees are really bad at that. So the next question is, can you clarify that the figure you showed with fruit set dropping away from the pollinizer is for cherry and not pear? You don't see the same thing for pear, correct? That's, that's right. For, not for fruit set, but I think it's possible that you see it with yield, but I don't have a data set on it. But for cherry, where you have much more severe compatibility issues, it is. Uh, um, so I imagine with pair you may see some kind of trend when it's at its most uh, most stark when you have a, a variety that really benefits from outcrossing for yield like bosque uh, seemed to have the biggest bumps when it outcrossed and thank you so much andoni those are our two questions so far oh we got another one um how are dandelions when compared to cherry blooms are bees more like more attracted to dandelions you know, we're, we'll hear a little bit more about that in Cherry because we have a data set uh, that we've done in collaboration with Chris um, uh, that, uh, but dandelions are fairly sweet, but we saw that at least in Cherry, they'd move up to, um, they would definitely move in, they were, you know, you see some on the dandelions, but they were mostly on the Cherry, but I think in Pear, it's more severe, but Chris, Oh, or Ashley, you may want to talk about uh, dandelions and thrips, because I think that's probably an area of where for thrip management, isn't there a recommendation for keeping some of the dandelions on the floor? Do you uh, know how do self-fertile trees affect pollination fruit sets? Well, we know uh, from what I understand in Cherry, uh, you uh, I'm not sure if uh, having a bee visitation sort of gets you higher yield. Like it's possible, there's probably growers in the room that do know the answer to this because just a bee coming in and shaking a flower is just going to transfer more pollen and get pollen on that stigma faster. Because uh, I'll have some, sh show you some data later. The longer a flower, a flower isn't pollinated, you end up getting less seeds. So you get the maximal seed when a flower opens and bang, it's just covered with pollen. And a bee can do that even in a self-compatible variety. But I'm not, I, ha I don't have a good data set on, you know, what are the benefits of like a real quick pollination versus, you know, um, uh, one that um, one that happens slower. I mean, that's not quite the question. But Chris, do you have any do you have any thoughts on this um, dandelion and thrip issue? Uh, I, that is, I I don't I I, um, I I don't know the current research on natural enemies. Um, that are supported in dandelions. Is that, that's what the question was. Yeah, that's the, that was the question. Okay. All right, well, let's move on. Um, I'm gonna move, take this competition issue um, uh, to another crop. I, Cause there isn't a really great data set uh, where um, I think the idea is manage the floor, but what if you have competing bloom in the surrounding landscape? Next week, we're going to see a great data set from the Dalles. All that balsam root, all that vetch that is 
blooming in the oak fragments is not pulling honeybees off your crop. I know that for sure. I mean, the less, we haven't done a lot of work in uh, Hood River, so I don't know how competing bloom uh, stacks up. This is a study from cranberries, which I thought was fascinating. So sorry this is so graph heavy folks, just like make the copy double strong and we'll get through this. But if you go to the left here, at the top left, you see a little graph here. It says hives per hectare in cranberry and yield. And it looks like you can almost keep adding more colonies and bumping up yield when you don't have a lot of surrounding bloom. So 10% woodland. But look what happens at the bottom. This is 80% woodland. There's a lot of competing bloom in these. Uh, in, this is in Wisconsin. There's all sorts of wild cherries and stuff in, uh, in the bush. And you can see what happens. You add extra colonies and you're just not getting the yield bump. So when there's a lot of competing bloom and you have an unattractive crop like cranberries, which I would say is pears, some of those benefits of boosting uh, stocking rates you won't get. And in this complicated graph here, they show um, if you've got, you know, if you've got 80%, uh, the color heat map shows you increases in yield. And if you've got 80% uh, competing bloom in the landscape, you're just not going to get a yield increase. You can't throw any more colonies into this situation and get a yield increase. You're going to have to deal somehow with that competing bloom. Whereas uh, you can see as you get, you can get yield increases in this, you know, by taking up the rate and it's actually profitable up to a point. Um, you, you still get yield increases, but the, for the cost of hives, you just, you know, it's not worth it. So they recommend a sweet spot. I'd love to see something like that for some Oregon crops as well, where we really kind of look at the landscape and peg out what exactly uh, uh, would be an ideal stocking rate. I also, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you, but it's gonna, I'm gonna bring it around to what you can do. Here's another concept I think that's important to get across is that sugar concentration and visitation is not constant through bloom. So this is uh, from Pear. Uh, from the UK. And you can see here, and I haven't seen a study like this elsewhere. And I almost, I, you know, I'm going to be in cherry again this year. And I'm kind of curious if the same thing happens. But the sugar concentration starts off really high. And then as you get towards the end of bloom, sugar concentration is coming down and the bees are coming away. And I think that last bit of bloom is also when you start to have a lot of competing bloom around. And so that kind of compounds the problem potentially is that your plants may not even be putting out nearly the sugar they were uh, as they've started to set some fruit. So one of the ideas, this is an old study from Washington. Uh, Dan Mayer did this. And I've heard people talk about this in pair. I remember being in the Okanagan in Canada uh, and people in the Similkameen in Canada and hearing about this practice. There's one beekeeper who just sort of like offered the service to pear growers about sequential introduction of colonies. So in this situation, um, this is in uh, Bartlett and Anjou, uh, and what uh, Dan did is he came in and at 10% bloom stocked with two colonies per acre, but then on, ha on, on one half of the field, he brought in an additional four colonies per acre at 50% bloom, and he compared it to the edge, the other edge where, you know, that was distanced from those extra colonies. And as you can see, each one of these um, orchards, there's 14 orchards here, but there's a large number of them that experienced quite an increase in fruit set by bringing in some additional colonies at mid bloom. And I'm just thinking about that previous graph about how sugar concentration is coming down. Uh, it's possible um, that you can, uh, without a lot of competing bloom, be able to really hammer uh, those last plants um, by brute force. I see there's a question, Ashley. It's a good time because I'm going to move on to something else. All right. And Joni, the question is, does it help in cherry to use bumblebees? You know, we've been working with Orchard View over the last little while, and I was surprised in the Dalles. And maybe, you know, in Wenatchee, it's different. And in Hood River, it's different. But I was surprised at how few bumblebees there are. Um, in those landscapes. So, so you know, uh, that's wild bumblebees and those are queen bumblebees at that time of year. So you're really not getting the densities. Uh, some of the companies now are producing, in Oregon, you cannot bring 
commercially produced bumblebees that are not native to the state. Um, in Washington, I believe, I'm not sure what the regulations are in Washington, but I do know that one of the uh, bumblebee producers has now come out with uh, Bombus vosnesenskii, a, um, a native bumblebee that I know some blueberry growers and some granberry growers have gotten. They're typically quite pricey. Like I think it might be worthwhile trying them out in pair, uh, but I would, uh, if you did start to work with them, work slowly. I had some experience with them in low bush blueberry and um, it took a while for them to get going. They're not like honeybees, my experience with them and things may have changed, but they didn't get started right away. It took a while for them to kind of get out and foraging. And then it was towards the end of bloom. And at that price point, I kind of expected a lot more. But I'm new to it. And that might be a good area of research if somebody's already doing it in pair. It'd be cool to find out. We've got another good question here. And Doni, how would the addition of bee pheromones help with these situations? Applying the pheromone to the trees, you need pollinated or to increase the movement of pollination in the field? I'll talk a little bit about pheromones in, uh, as we go along. So um, uh, uh, let me bring it up when we get to it, Ashley. It's a, it's a great question. I think lots of people uh, are interested. Sounds great. Thank you, Andoni. Okay. All right. So the recommendation um, is, you know, two highs per acre. Uh, you're coming in with a colony that should, you know, you should pop the lids and, you know, they should be in two boxes when they're coming in and you should pop the lids and there should be, you know, that top should be full of bees. But the other thing is in this publication that we have, uh, it's, you're supposed to have, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, a hundred bees per minute flying back into the colonies. And I want to, I've done some research in blueberries. I'm going to talk about using this metric. And, um, and uh, I think it's actually a useful metric for you driving around in your truck, or I guess you're bringing colonies in. Well, I don't know if it would work on the landing pads, but it, when, when colonies kind of set down, you can drive around and you can actually use this as a rule of thumb to see if the colonies are strong enough. But I just want to point out that we do have some issues. Uh, you know, getting strong colonies in. And I'm, when I talk about retain at the end, I think, you know, we sometimes have delays in colonies coming back. This was a couple of years ago. Uh, we had a lot of rain uh, in California. Beekeepers had a hard time getting out. Or you have a situation where things are warming up in the Pacific Northwest, but it's cool in California and almond production. And so we have this situation where beekeepers are racing to get back to cherry. Uh, and that can lead to some delays. And just to keep get a sense of the landscape here, uh, the rental market for uh, bee colonies, forget the alfalfa, that's not a rental market, that's just another managed uh, alfalfa leaf cutting bees. But you can see how um, there's a lot of competition at this time of year uh, when cherries are coming. There's some tight turnarounds uh, that uh, uh, beekeepers are facing. And I just, it, it worth, uh, just pointing out the price difference. So almonds are really, you know, uh, this is a survey that we've conducted over the last 30 years or so. And you can see almonds just, it, it's a, you can cover all your operation costs with almond pollination. The one thing I will point out is that two crops that are kind of like hard to do simultaneously is cherry and blueberry. And as I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, blueberry is uh, hard on bees. And so every, all the beekeepers that I talk to who come into cherry love coming into cherry. I also don't hear a lot of complaints from pear. I think beekeepers in general don't suffer the same kind of problems that they do in blueberry. So that's a, a real plus for your industry. Okay, I'm gonna move on to pheromones and I noticed I don't have um, uh, exactly what um, I, so I've, I've got a picture of the pheromone. So the, the, I guess the thing I was going to point out here is that I, a couple of years ago, I went through the pheromone research and I noticed that with the attractants, um, the research wasn't real solid. Like it seemed a lot, quite variable. The only kind of pheromone that seemed to really be consistent, not available on the market. And you can see it's like poorly commercialized. It's like a old slide with some pheromone on it. It's where you would trick the bees into thinking they had additional brood. And with um, 
because it had the odor of a brood of the brood, the immature bees, and that would pump up um, foraging rates. Uh, I believe this study is from carrot seed, but um, but that product never commercialized, and a lot of these products come on the market, and um, they just don't. Um, there's not a real um, from what I remember looking at this research, there's, there's not a real strong, um, a strong attractant out there in the same way that you would with, um, you know, pheromones when you're trying to monitor for something like coddling moth. And Donnie, we did, we had a student try to, when this first came out, <clears throat> place these yellow twin tubes and they're the pheromone in those is a queen mandibular pheromone and then a, an aggregation pheromone the, or that the, the bees, the worker bees would use to kind of identify where the, the hive is. I, I, if I'm remembering it right, it's a combination of two. And so those are not, th those pheromones are not something a worker bee, a forager bee would be looking for in an orchard. So that was one of the, the things that, that was a, kind of a concern. Um, we did the tests in apples and we put them out at 400 per acre and 200 per acre. Um, and we looked at um, fruit set. So one of the challenges as Andoni's pointed out is for some of these crops like apples, there's already full pollination and they actually do a thinning stage where they, they remove some of the fruit. So so that they're not really struggling with full pollination in an apple system. Um, and what we found is that, that these, there wasn't a measurable effect. One of the things that we let, failed to do that we should have done is, is look at seed set. Uh, there might've been a bump in seed set, but, but these pheromones um, don't necessarily motivate bees to, to visit a tree that it wouldn't have already visited. And as Andoni already pointed out, they have a kind of a memory. Once they find a good source, they go back to it. And a pheromone, um, a queen mandibular pheromone doesn't necessarily pull them off that um, preferred, that memory of going to that tree where they've found success before. So the, the, the research is not strong. I've yet to see concise evidence that this works, but it feels good to do it. It smells good. It was a lot of fun to do the research. Um, but I don't know that you're seeing a return on investment. So the, the research is incomplete. You know, they only, I, it, I, did, I didn't realize that this, this was uh, also had uh, queen mandibular pheromone in it. The, there is a old data set, uh, again, from British Columbia with pears, but it was sprayed on. And I remember it, there was a, there was an increase, but it was a real, like the molecule didn't last that long. And so you had to do reapplication. It wasn't cost effective. So I do wonder, um, I remember the, I guess the other thing, a similar data set came from, uh, Lisa DeVetter in Mount Vernon working in blueberries where she looked at these, uh, dispensers as well and didn't see an increase. And that's a crop that's also not that attractive uh, compared to something like cherry. I think in, it probably needs to be, research needs to be done in a crop that really struggles to get full fruit set. And maybe maybe there we could see something, but from many of these other crops, um, we're not able to measure a, a difference. So Ashley, have, I see, yeah. I was, about to, I was about to chime in. We have another question here, um, kind of along the same lines. Have you heard anything about using prime hive pheromones. I'm not sure if that's something quite different from what you're talking about. I don't know that one. I don't know that one. I just, I just talked to a company the other day that's trying to get into blueberries. They have something about adding the scent of blueberry into the syrup as a way to increase foraging. And um, there's a lot of small startups. Like, it's almost like the pheromone it's like the pheromone industry. There's a, you don't, you have a lot of small startups that are, you know, um, you have some preliminary data and sometimes, you know, they, they hit it right and you've got something that works, but, um, um, but I don't know about this one. So this question I think is really important. Can you have too many hives per acre for cherries or apples? Is there an optimum hive number for these different crops? I, well, 
with Apple, of obviously you you can because you're going to have thinning problems, but the um, but with Cherry, I think this came up recently. And when Jim, if if Jim is able to make the call, I can talk about this. He, there was a trial in Washington with mason bees and honeybees, and the you know they had high fruit set, a uh, higher fruit set with the additional with the addition of mason bees, but not higher yield. So you have the problem is that if you don't have if the plant isn't sort of dialed into the higher fruit set that you're just going to lose the fruit and that's the the cost so you're going to have to and i that part i'm more interested in talking to some growers about the extent to which um they they have good data on how to kind of adjust um, their crop fertility and crop management for higher fruit set We have one more question that got typed into the chat box and not the Q and A box. Um, okay. If all of your cherry trees are self-pollinating, should you add bees? I don't know any. So that yeah, I'm so sorry. That that's a great question. I imagine you'll get a. a no, I don't know. Uh, if somebody else in the I saw Mike was out there. Um, has some experience with this. This is a. Uh, a question that uh, probably most of you know, but I don't, I have, that was not what came across my, my, um, um, I didn't, I didn't run into it. I imagine you will. I imagine there's going to be, even in a self-compatible variety, you know, even like in pear, for example, where it is self-compatible, you do get these yield increases, but I don't know what the yield increases would be. And I think, um, I don't know the answer. Gosh. Mike, Mike is saying, yes, they still require bees, which was my, my first thought. And it goes back to something you said, Andoni, is that you, you have those bees shaking and moving more of that pollen off of those flowers, right? So it makes sense that it would be helpful. Okay. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thanks, Ashley. So just to move on, the other thing that I also don't know quite a lot about is putting uh, dispensers. So what a dispenser is, uh, somebody goes through uh, and takes the prunes uh, stems. Uh, and there's a company in Washington that does this, and then you can get the, you know, the pollinizer pollen. Uh, you can order it, and then they put it on the dispenser. And as the bees leave the colony, they are, you know, they they're covered with this pollen, which they're going to comb off pretty quickly. But the idea is that they're just so coated by the time they get to the orchard. Um, they'll be able to drop some of that pollen off. And there is some evidence in almonds under some co some conditions, like very severe conditions where there's just not enough pollinizers that you can get in the orchard that you can get some yield increase uh, by putting um, uh, by putting these inserts. But uh, it's it, it, just to point out, it is um, it's a pretty pricey treatment. If you think about the cost per colony, um, uh, it is fairly high. And I don't know how that pencils out in terms of I'm in a situation where I've got a hard to pollinate cherry cultivar. I didn't have enough pol uh, pollinizers planted. Uh, you know, you know, is this, is this profitable? I don't know the, um, how that pencils out, but it is an option. So just to be clear, the idea is that you would order in, you'd say, I have this cultivar of, uh, cherry. I need, um, the compatible pollen, and then they would send this to you. Okay, I do want to address this question of increasing stocking rate. And I think there's research that's been popping up And this. I have a weekly podcast. Um, and on one of the issues, uh, we had uh, Matt Arrington, who is Lisa DeVetter's student working in Blueberry. And lo and behold, when they did studies where they up uh, stocking rate, they found they got yield increases that were profitable. And I think there's a lot of these studies starting to pop up where uh, lo and behold, you go a little bit higher and you can pump a little bit more yield out. And the thing that we were interested in though in, in Blueberry was you could maybe increase the stocking rate, but there was an issue in Blueberry specifically, the beekeepers didn't want to increase the stocking rate. And the reason for this, and you're going to hear about it from your beekeepers is when they go into blueberries, they get beat up. And so here you can see a disease that's rampant in blueberries. And I'll have to set, tell you when beekeepers come to, this is a selling point for you because when beekeepers come to orchard fruits at the same time, they don't see this. 
They don't see these disease problems. They really love coming to do orchard fruit pollination, but this disease really can get out of control. And, uh, you know, when in blueberries, this is in two years of data, when they come into pollination, this is the severity of this disease in the colony. You can see only, you know, in these four farms, five colonies have the disease, but when they leave, they're kind of full of it. And same thing last year, one colony came in with the disease and there was a number of colonies um, that uh, were uh, infected leaving pollination. So that got us thinking in blueberries about what about just doing more with less? And in blueberries, they specify three colonies per acre. Um, and, um, but we were curious about this recommendation of 100 bees per minute. And when Lisa DeVetter did a survey of blueberry, um, blueberry fields across um, Washington, she found here's that 100 bees per minute threshold that's a minimum pollination strength colony. And she found everything failed. Not one field in two years met that minimum standard. And that got us thinking, is, what does the standard mean? And so we went back and couldn't find literature linking it up to colony strength. And so we did a whole bunch of studies where we would you know, take these colonies, we'd videotape the front, and we'd get these counts. And uh, you can see here's two examples. One's at that threshold of 100 bees per minute, and one on the left is way below it. And when we looked in those colonies and we actually counted the number of bees, it turned out that that, that rule of thumb of 100 bees per minute was quite a ways off. So here you can see 100, roughly 100 bees per minute. It's supposed to be six frames of bees, six frames completely covered with bees. And we found that 14 frames were completely covered with bees. And even this you know, substandard 27 bees per minute you know, still had quite a few bees in it. And we were able to create a nice um, relationship uh, between the incoming flight and, and the frames of bees. So six frames of bees is what you're supposed to be getting from your beekeeper for pollination. And you can see it corresponds really nicely. And there's the frames and um, these are the bees per minute. And it corresponds really nicely um, uh, with about, I think we said here, 100 bees per minute is about 11 frames of adult bees. So that's a really strong colony. But if you are getting things that were coming around about 40 frames per bee of bee, 40 bees per minute flying back into the colony, um, that is a pollination strength colony. Um, and the two things I want to say about this, it was independent of temperature. So if we measured it at 60 or we measured it at 72, we still got the relationship. Uh, and it was fairly, you know, fairly robust relationship. So the thing is, this took a lot of videotaping and looking at the colonies, but we are coming up with a video on the extension website to train you because it actually, you can tell the difference between a colony that's really high, a colony that's at grade and one that's below grade. And you can do it from the, uh, from your truck. You just look at it. We think we can train you to be able to sort of roughly uh, eyeball these things. And what was good to note, uh, and we'll take questions in just one second, but what was good to note was that when we adjusted things, in fact, in blueberry fields, and these are about the same time of colonies being delivered to cherry and pear, a lot of them in the one year were above grade, at the second year they were below grade. And so that got us thinking about, well, everybody's talking about increasing stocking rate and nobody's looking at colony quality. And I wondered if you could actually increase yield in blueberry. And I would suggest in your crops, not by increasing that stocking rate, but just really keeping an eye on the strength of the colonies coming in. And in fact, we did see this and it was a huge bump in yield. So this is in Duke. Uh, you see the incoming flight per minute. This is the minimum standard here. You can see most of the colonies are above that minimum standard. Um, but what we found, here's the yield on the left hand side and kilograms per acre is roughly pounds per, uh, uh, kilograms per hectare is kind of pounds per acre, kind of works roughly the same. And here's the flights per minute. And you can see we're getting some huge bumps in yield by getting a uh, higher, uh, higher grade colonies. Um, and we didn't see a significant effect of cultivar. It was independent and we got, um, we got these yield bumps. So I think there's a lot of, uh, there's 
we're really interested in kind of training you to go out and look at these colonies and see if you can, you know, talk with your beekeeper and just kind of, you know, insist on getting stronger colonies. You're in a good bargaining position. People love coming to cherries anyways. They, uh, you know, I also like going to pears. They don't like going to blueberries. So I think being able to sort of say how those, you, uh, a couple of those pallets were on the weak side. Uh, I think that can help uh, improve quality. And uh, I think there are yield benefits there. I see there's some questions. I'm going to move on to something else after this. So we have a couple of questions, um, some older questions here. Mike has a question. When you say frames, what size of super are you using? Deep, shallow, et cetera. We see a wide variation in super sizes. Yeah, and I guess that's a good point. And the other thing to point out is that you're also getting eight frame colonies and, and 10 frame colonies. So you, sometimes you get a pallet of six colonies and sometimes you get a pallet of four. You'll notice those colonies are slightly narrower. So when I'm talking about frames here, it's a standard Langstroth frame. And so you can see in this, in this specific picture, they've got a, um, a three quarter depth box on the bottom. And so we would convert it to uh, a Langstroth uh, units. So when you, when we say six frames of bees, we mean six of the kind of standard Langstroth size rather than the ones that are slightly smaller. Cause you're going to see, I think we go back a couple, you'll see this situation sometimes where the person's got a standard box and then they've got a smaller box on the bottom. I know there's been research. Uh, I did a lot of hybrid canola seed pollination work in Alberta. And I know that, um, different configurations of the brood nest don't necessarily mean anything. It's really the strength. Uh, it's the strength of the, of the colony. So I wouldn't pay attention too much to the boxes, but I think what Mike was getting at is well, how, what did I mean by six frames of bee, bees? I mean, six frames of this kind of a colony. Oh, sorry, muted. Um, here's a question I've been getting more recently. Uh, would bouquets of pollen help? I'm talking about putting branches in water in strategic places. And I've also heard things oh, like yeah. trying to plant things strategically um, within your tree rows. Those are some questions we've been having in the mid-Columbia. Um, you know what? I'll, I don't know the answer to that. Chris, if you know the answer, what we might do is before the next session, we'll track these down. And uh, we'll start the session with just uh, answering these questions because I'm uh, I've seen it done experimentally. So a lot of the experiments, what they'll do is they'll take a big cage around a pear tree, and they'll put a bouquet inside the pear tree, and then they'll get that crossing. But I just don't know if it's uh, um, the extent to which. Uh, and I'm sure somebody on this call does know the answer. But Chris, do you know the answer? Uh, I, I don't. I don't know about. Um... A bouquet. Um, I don't know that that's scalable. We did research trying to do pollinator plantings of wildflowers on the margins of apple orchards, trying to um, increase habitat and resources for native pollinators, as well as honeybees, to try to make kind of make the make the bees happier, give them a more balanced nutritional diet. Um, and again, the results were, were inconclusive. We, we I, I can uh, try to dig up that paper to make sure that I, I'm speaking correctly. But it's, I mean, there's lots of people have looked at dandelions and leaving the grass um, and the wildflower mixture in the dry rows while bees are in the orchard and research to see if it's competing and drawing the bees down away from the but, um, I, but I haven't heard anyone trying to do bouquets. Um, that might work a, a small scale, I guess. I'll have to look at the research. This question is kind of along those same lines. Since bees are pollen generalists and are going to gather pollen from various sources anyway, wouldn't it decrease the effects of external competition by providing high pollen, low carbohydrate flora on the orchard floor to minimize flight outside the orchard? Oh, can you say that again? That was a dense, well thought out question. Yeah, since bees are pollen generalists yeah. and are going to gather pollen from various sources anyway, wouldn't it decrease the effect of external competition by providing high pollen, low carbohydrate flora on the orchard floor to minimize flight outside of the orchard? 
Yeah, it could, I guess. And I get the thing is, is that uh, one should differentiate as well that not all the the, the bees uh, have a division of labor, honeybees do at least. So they're pollen foragers and nectar foragers. And um, one thing I should dig up for the next session is I don't know the how much more effective a nectar foraging bee is. So if you had a really good pollen source in pair, uh, it's possible that it would draw the, uh, the pollen foraging bees off the pair. Although I, I, there is a study that shows that with this is getting into the weeds a bit, but that pear pollen is actually more nutritious than other. So there's a kind of trade-off in that, you know, apple has the, has the sweetest nectar, but kind of the poorest pollen. It's not a terrible pollen, but the pear has the best pollen and the least sweet nectar. So it's, I'm not sure um, that would work. I think the nectar is, uh, is a key driver here and I think you just need to manage the, the floor in pair. Now that I've thought my way through the answer. <laughs> so is there a standard test to evaluate purchased pollen viability and what is the life of purchased pollen? Oh, that's great. Yeah, it is short. So I've looked at, there was a great study from France. I can, if um, we'll put my email in the inbox, I'll send it to you. Uh, but it looked at uh, pollen viability over time and um, you know, it really does need to be fresh frozen pollen um, that is, you know, uh, just a, you know, a month old really loses a lot of viability. So that, that fresh pollen is really key. And I think um, these, I haven't talked to these companies. I did talk to, you know, one of the companies, a couple of companies before this call, but not to the pollen people, but they're, they're you know, they're kind of uh, flushing their, um, their flowers quite uh, close to the time of bloom. So it might be fresher than I think, but that's a good question to ask them. Ask them as well. And there are ways to test for pollen viability. There's a lot of tests and I would ask them about it. Ask them if it's uh, viable. Um, can you discuss the effects of wind on bee flight and should this factor uh, suggest placement <laughs> of your beehives? <laughs> Yeah, it's windy where you got, it's windy in the gorge. So I guess not all of you are in that area, but yeah, wind picks up, the bee flight goes down for sure. And so um, there's a couple of scientists, older scientists that say you need one, you know, if you had good bloom, you, had, you hit bloom at the right time and you had a good hot still day, you could probably do most of the crop. And so um, I guess the idea is that they're gonna be bad days it's just going to blow too much and the bees are just not, but so you're, but I think what you're asking is if you went out and did these recording, if you did, went out and looked at these colonies on those windy days, would you still get this relationship? Cause that'd be a great day to go out and do some driving. And I don't know the answer to that. And I think I'm going to try and answer that next time I'm in the, uh, in the, uh, in mid Columbia, I'm going to pick some windy days and do these recordings. Cause I'd actually don't know if that affects the counts. So, um, one of our growers just wanted to point out that in the early 2000s, when Regina first became uh, popular and in production, people tried putting out these bouquets and they really didn't seem to have any noticeable effect on fruit set. I think there's a scalability problem. For yeah. Sure. And, and as soon as you cut a plant, I think the viability of, of that pollen starts to become a problem. I, th I think the pollinator plantings is a better long-term solution. And that's exactly what uh, our, our grower here had to say. Thank you, Mike. Fantastic, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna move along. And I, I, I did get a message from our uh, Mason Bee producer. He's on his way. So um, that'll time just perfectly because I'm just headed in that direction. But before I do that, I wanna deal with this question in Blueberry and I don't know, I, I've got all these blueberry examples and I don't know how they translate, but so we had this question in blueberry about the situation on the left where the person has two big landings and just stocks, you know, four colonies per acre and big landings versus what you see on the right, which, uh, um, you know, you have a pallet every few meters and it, uh, whether that um, is a, you get higher yields. And the result from two years of data, we had a, uh, 
anywhere from 4.7 colonies per drop to 39 colonies per drop. There was a slight but non-significant um, uh, decrease in yield when you went to these higher uh, drop situations, but they weren't significant. And so it, um, we're going to be doing more of that work in Blueberry just to test it out because it does create a lot. Well, I guess in your situation where you're, where a lot of you are placing your colonies, uh, it's one thing, but here the, the beekeepers have to place the colonies and they have to service them. And those just repeated stops become a real pain. The other thing I would point out, and this is maybe perhaps um, less of an issue. Uh, here we go. Less of an issue in, uh, well, no, I guess it's the same thing. So here we've got a situation that a beekeeper doesn't really like. So they've got the pallet right up against the blueberry. And, you know, it's same as you guys and gals. Uh, they've got air blast sprayers. There's no way they can protect these plants with fungicide and not you know, douse these colonies. And so having a setback is great. The problem, of course, in the Willamette Valley, a setback like this is possible. And I know you have trees right up to the fence lines. And so finding spots like this may be difficult, but it doesn't seem to have, um, uh, and we're gonna be looking in blueberries to see if there's some yield impacts of kind of setting them back like this. But I will say, I did talk to a couple of cherry beekeeper uh, beekeepers and they wanted me to convey this message. They said, be very careful where you're putting those colonies. Uh, make sure they're in good sunny spots with good air drainage. If you put them in uh, cold spots, they're just going to fly a lot later. You're going to miss a lot of foraging. So if you've got, a, you, if you if your option is like dispersing colonies through the orchard, or putting them in one hot sunny spot, um, especially I would say in cherry, maybe in pear there are some benefits from distributing because it's an unattractive crop, but in cherry, they're going to, they're going to push out across that crop. It's attractive and it's better to have them in one good hot spot than sort of like in little shallow spots that, you know, are not going to get the sun until, you know, 11 AM. There's a question uh, came in, Ashley. Yeah, this is a really great one. The use of cover crops to increase the density, diversity, and duration of bee forage in orchards is encouraged by some. Is this a good idea for pear because they already suffer uh, more from competition from crops with more sugar in their nectar? And more general, yes or no to use cover crops to increase pollination in orchards? That is going to be the topic next week, and Chris is going to be speaking uh, on this issue as well. We have been working with Orchard View in cherry with the cover crops and the cover crops in some ways are serving bee biodiversity more general because you know if you plant mustard and you know Mike can speak to this but if you plant mustard in the fall it's not going to bloom coincidentally it's going to come on just towards the end of bloom and so there's there's very few plants apart from you know um the weeds that will be kind of doing competing bloom. The bloom is so early. Um, and so I would say, and, and, and I would say in cherry, you don't want anything competing. <laughs> All evidence shows any competition in cherry is gonna draw bees away. So cherry in particular, I think, but you can help bee biodiversity. Like you can maybe help the recruitment of bees to a, the next generation, at least the wild ones by having stuff that blooms uh, later. And that, again, next week, that's that's what we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna talk about all that kind of pollinator planting stuff. Okay, I'm going to move on to, I think uh, uh, Jim is gonna be here in just a few minutes. So I'm just gonna set him up a little bit and say, so what about other bees? And I told you that, um, these there are some other bees that can um, that are perhaps better at pollinating um, orchard crops and orchard mason bees are one of them. Here you can see a study from Europe, and it's these are different bees in different contexts, but where um, you know the more visitation by these wild bees, the higher the fruit set. They're just a little bit better at transferring pollen. Uh, and um, much more effective. You can get higher fruit set when you get a visitation by one of these bees. And I'm used to this because when I worked in Southern Alberta, we had a 2B system. So this is a hybrid canola seed field. You can see the, you can see the bays through the middle of the, the male bays and the female bays. Big, you know, uh, 
two colonies per acre uh, stocking rate with honeybee colonies. And then in the middle, they'd have these leaf cutting bees. Uh, here you can see them, the domiciles, they'd incubate the cocoons up there. These bees would go out. And what they ended up doing is it seemed as though by having two bees, you kind of pushed the other bee around. So honeybees were kind of disrupted by these other bees and they would be more likely to cross from, you can see here, we've got a plant with no anthers on it. This is a sterile plant. This is where the seed crop is gonna be made. A couple meters away, there's a, a, a plant that has the anthers and the name of the game is to move pollen across that bay. And these leaf cutting bees did some of that pollination, but they seem to be really good at also pushing honeybees to work better. And so having them work together seemed to be a good strategy. Um, I'm gonna talk about leaf cutting bees, but Jim's gonna be here in a minute and he'll talk about um, mason bees. And um, he's a real pro. He's the largest producer of these bees in the Pacific Northwest and does a lot of pollination in almonds. So in almonds, they've increasingly, cause they've been able to bring the cost down and there's such a high price point for honeybee colonies and almonds. Uh, they've been able to introduce these bees into do pollination alongside honeybees uh, in almonds. And I'm just gonna just point th this out in almonds. It has been shown in almonds that when you have honeybees alone, you've got this problem where, and I think pollinizers and almond, if I remember right, are in opposite rows. And so you have the situation where honeybees will kind of like move down the row and occasionally cross over, but mostly work down the row so that there's a lot of pollen on the, on the stigmas, but only see here one germinates and goes down and results in fertilization. Whereas honeybees behavior kind of alters when you put mason bees in the mix because they're start to start crossing more. And so there seems to be a lot more of those pollen grains that land on the stigmas that actually germinate and are viable. I'm gonna, uh, but Jim will be here in a minute and he'll tell us a little bit about that, but uh, how, uh, uh, keep your eye out for uh, uh, Jim Watts there, Ashley, if, uh, if he pops up. And we do have a question as well. We do. Um, any thoughts on the honeybee foraging models available on DAS? Is it accurate and reliable? Have you taken a look at that at all, Andoni? No, but that was the idea where I'm a part of an SCRI right now, uh, USDA grant to do the same thing in Blueberry. And it is the model in the nation, it seems to be, um, you know, uh, and it's, a, it's it, remind me, it's an Apple specific one, right? It's only for apples. I haven't used that tool. I, I, it's in the middle of kind of some transition and I put it, I just, I wrote it down when I saw that question. I'll look into how that model's calculated and what, for what fruit. I, I saw a data set on it and it looked really uh, well done. And I think those kinds of forecasting models are really good. And it actually sets up really well for this next section because, uh, you know, these temperature models not only give you a sense of, um, you know, not only, you know, bee foraging and their capacity when you hit those prime days. Cause I think the issue in these models is where's bloom at and when do you have these prime days? And if you have a good day at the right time, you can really pollinate a lot of fruit. And so if you have a way of knowing that you've hit that point, it's, you know, really helpful. Um, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about this in a second, in terms of, you know, what happens if your bees are, are late your bees don't come on time, you've got bloom already, or, you know, um, it's really heating up out there and you just really want to hold on to those flowers, what can you do? The flowers will time out. And if they time out, no visitation is going to get you there. And a lot of that is temperature dependent. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to move on. We'll start on this other stuff and then uh, Jim will pop in here. So um, your, the ovules in your, uh, in, your, uh, fr uh, in your flowers, they can start to um, uh, die out. And then you can see this work that came from WSU is really great. Uh, there's a way to measure this. You can actually uh, monitor uh, the ovules and see if they're starting to decay and starting to go downhill. 
And in this research that was done at WSU, they set up these uh, scenarios where they uh, set the temperature regimes at uh, kind of like a, a simulated, you know, high temperature uh, during or orchard pollination and a simulated low temperature. Uh, and it's in centigrade. So I just thought, I'm, I'm, if you haven't figured it out already, I'm Canadian, so I can't quite do the conversion, but you can see what the conversion is here. So on the high one, it's kind of going up to about, you're getting a high during the day of 68 and um, it's not going, uh, it's, it's uh, not going uh, below 50 at night. So that's like a, a hot temperature regime that you would experience during pollination. And so you can see here what happens under those situations. Um, so let's bring them in here. We've got cultivars that are pretty resistant to this. So you can get to um, under this high temperature regime, you can see uh, the, you know, um, the um, where almost all the ovules are shot uh, versus uh, they're all good. And you can see in these cultivars here, um, and they're kind of laid out side by side, they are really kind of fairly resistant to these high temperature regimes. But Sweetheart and Regina uh, um, in Cherry, you can see they are liable. Like you get some high temperatures and those ovules are gonna start to crash. And so um, that can become a problem. And so a problem in two senses, the bees are delayed. You can't get the bees in, the flowers are opening. Um, they're starting to die. And the second sense is it starts to get hot out. And even if your bees are there, you just, those flowers got to get pollinated quick or else they're going to, they're going to cack out. So I reached out to Valent and asked them about Retain because I knew Retain was being used um, in almonds and Retain uh, works on the same principle as this, your banana, you know, the ethylene oxide uh, ripens your banana. If you had something that would inhibit that, you could uh, keep your banana in a green state for a very long time. And the same thing happens um, uh, with flowers here. You can see they've got the flowers and they have these little septa so they can suck up the gases. And you can see here um, it, uh, regularly after, this, these are cherry flowers, Regina, in fact, after about three or four days, uh, they start to produce ethylene oxide, which results in the flower decaying. But if they're treated with Retain, um, this plant growth regulator, uh, it delays it. It slows that process. It's kind of an elixir of life. It kind of keeps them preserved uh, until a bee can visit the flower. So here, I'm going to show you, this is again, this is from Valent. I um, had a good conversation with them before this talk. And you can see here are five stages, popcorn all the way to this doesn't even look like a flower anymore, stage five. And on this graph, you can see um, what happens is you get, so these are days after the treatment is applied. And you can see stage one is like this popcorn stage and you can hold your flowers uh, depending on the two packet or one packet rate uh, at an earlier stage for longer. The other thing is the stigmas uh, are, uh, apparently stay uh, in better shape. So this is stage one stigma. This is where the pollen lands. You can see it's nice and fresh, but as you start to go to stage two and three, you could probably get a pollen grain on there, but it's it, very few of them are gonna germinate and actually be able to set fruit. And so here you can see um, what happens when you do treat flowers with retain. Um, you're able to keep them at a lower stage, a more receptive stigma for longer over time. And so this can, depending, it, it depends on the context. If it's cool out and there's the bees are delivered on time, you probably don't see any increase. If you're in a situation where it's going hot, the bees haven't come in, um, you can get these yield increases um, by, uh, you know, treating early on, um, and you see the application date here is popcorn uh, to full bloom, uh, you can get these yield increases. And um, they've had some great um, images here from Tim Dolly's uh, farm. Um, so this is kind of local, at least for those of you in Oregon, you can see the untreated with one pouch of retain. 
And there's just a couple of slides here just showing, you know, what it looks like in terms of um, side by side comparison with untreated plots. And again, I think this really depends on this is 2019 season, it really depends on the season and it really depends on, you know, um, your ability to get bees in early. I just want to mention that Tim, Stacy Cooper, and Mount Adams Orchard were all a part of this little uh, trial by by Valent. Oh, there, yeah, Stacy Cooper. I didn't know who the Cooper was. Thank you. <laughs> Here we see Skeena's. So just a, uh, um, and here's one from Mount Adams in Washington. Okay, so um, is I just want to see is um, is Jim on the call yet? Oh, he's probably he said if he was going to be in around now. So, yep, I just promoted him to a panelist. Okay. So Jim was a speaker, I believe, two years ago at the Winter Hort meeting. Hey, Jim. I I just arrived. <laughs> <laughs> I literally just sat down. Awesome. Can you see me okay and everything? We can see you fine, yeah. Great. Awesome. Are you so ready for me to go ahead? We are. We talked a little bit about mason bees. I talked about them moving honeybees around and getting a lot more cross-pollination. And I talked about almonds. I talked about the price coming down. So just give us a sense of where the industry is right now and the capacity to um, provide uh, bees. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I have been out at uh, visiting uh, alfalfa seed growers this morning. Uh, we're working on leafcutter bee pricing for the year. And so I wasn't able to get on sooner. So I appreciate your patience with me. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me, Anthony. Um, yeah, so in terms of uh, mason bee uh, uh, pollination, um, we've come a long ways, I would say in probably the last five years, things have, have moved rather quickly. Um, we've gone from very much in the experiment, experimentation mode to where now we're doing um, a couple thousand acres of um, varieties of different types of crops, primarily almonds right now. Um, almond industry is um, taking the uh, bulk of the mason bee production that's out there. Um, and that's primarily because they obviously are paying a lot of money for uh, pollination, which is a big issue um, for them. Uh, we are, uh, we do have bees available, however, um, as an industry, um, we've gone from the thousands of bees to the millions of bees, which is exciting uh, to see. Um, we're having success in a variety of crops, almonds, obviously. Um, we have a ton of research that's been done in almonds where we can do one honeybee hive per acre, which is half of what they normally do with, with just a thousand mason bees. And our growers are able to get a bump in yield. And so uh, that's, that's been a pretty exciting uh, development uh, for the industry. Uh, the almond bloom and cherry bloom, of course, are a very similar type of a bloom. Um, they're both a preferred bloom of the mason bee. And so these bees should do very well in cherries. We have a few small growers that are using them in cherries at this point with uh, really good results. Um, seems like the initial um, usage of these bees in cherries has been in hard to set varieties where guys have issues for some reason with pollination. And so um, that's where we've been um, uh, using them the most. The USDA is currently doing a three-year study on um, cherries and um, pears. And what we really need at this point is some um, yield data of what kind of yields you can expect uh, using mason bees so that um, we can present that to you to be able to you know, see the benefits uh, to you. Um, we have that information in almonds and that's why that's really taken off. We had about seven years of really good research that showed we could get a 10 to 30% bump in yield. And then it was just a matter of getting our pricing aligned so that um, it became economical so that that, that yield increase put a little extra money in our growers' hands. And so that's kind of where we're at uh, today. 
Um, I know from my understanding at this point, I think there's still be enough bees available uh, on the market to do maybe another thousand acres of, uh, I think the almond industry is already pretty well set on how many bees they're taking for the year. Uh, we're gonna have bloom down there in about uh, two to three weeks. So that's uh, pretty well settled, I think. So there's probably enough bees still available um, to do another, I'd say about a thousand acres of other crops that, would, that we could do. Um, and it would be great to see some of that happening in the Northwest, Oregon, Washington. It's interesting, the, variety, the, the most production of these bees is happening in Oregon and Washington. That, that's where most of the uh, propagation is happening and um, where the, it seems like the producers are centered. So um, it's a great opportunity to take a bee that's been um, native to your area and, and uh, employ it uh, for the production of food. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of where the industry is right now. And uh, we look forward to a good year. I don't know if there's any questions on that. There is, yeah, there is a question that just came in, Jim. Yeah, uh, Jim, have you tried mason bees in pairs? Uh, yes, we have. So um, the last two years, um, this study we've been doing, on, we've been doing some pairs. USDA has been doing some pairs in the Yakima area and they've had some really good results on that. The study is not completed yet. They're going to do it again this year, and then we'll have a uh, we'll have more of a solid thing to show you. I personally have a grower up in the OMAC area that uses the mason bee. He's been using them for about five years now in his pairs, and he loves it because he gets really good pollination. And then using his thinning methods, he's able to get just the right size and shape to his pears and he's getting top dollar every year out of his pears. And so we've been doing his acreage for about five years now. Uh, you know, I, I was gonna also mention that um, we do have a proposal, Western Sierra proposal that Chris um, and um, our colleagues at WSU and Utah State and if it does come in, we will be doing a lot more education and some demonstrations um, um, and hopefully, you know, more in pair uh, uh, in Oregon. I see there's another question that came in as well. Yeah, we have another question about retain. So what are the possible negative effects of retain besides cost? In terms of the sprays? Um, oh, good. Yeah, you have experience yeah. in almonds. Yeah, so... You know, that, I never know how to answer these questions. Um, we have a couple of growers who have tried it in almonds and they have not felt like it was worth the money. Um, that, that's been my, my experience. Well, I've got two growers that have tried it down there and then they're, they're no, no longer using it. Um, they didn't feel like it was worth the cost benefits. You know, and I, I heard something very similar talking to the, you know, the rep, he said, you really need to think about how you're going to use it. Like it, it, in terms of just like a, a, a kind of like supplement, it doesn't make sense. It's really when you're in a, a bind, you've got hot weather coming on or something like that. And things are going to, or your bees haven't showed up. It's kind of like those situations are kind of prime for it. But just in terms of like, right, it's a, it is a costly treatment. I can't remember what, what he was quoting, but. Yeah. It seemed very expensive. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and the mason bee, the mason bees too. We are still priced wise, um, you know, for cherries and pears, it's still it's still not it's not cheap. Uh, there's no I don't there's no way to sugarcoat it. Okay, it's going to be more expensive than honeybees, um, but I think the returns, you know, over, you know, if you if you look at a five year return on it, I think it it'll still pencil out for you, um, and especially if you're it's really about yields, right? And if, if you're getting the right yields, then the, pr the price is not really that big of an issue as long as the yields are there. And we have a really great, uh, so Jim and I are both part uh, members of the Orchard Bee Association. We have a really good webinar for growers uh, on the uh, Orchard Bee Association website. Um, uh, for you to check it out. So all the, uh, I think one of the, one of the uh, presentations is from an almond grower has a lot of experience using mason, mason bees in those systems. 
uh, give you a sense of like, you know, what the workflow is like. Thanks so much for joining us today, Jim. I had some some questions about where to, how to get in contact with you. So I just posted your website in the chat box. Oh, good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's also great that Jim is, uh, is an OSU uh, alum, so. <laughs> Go Beavers. Go <Hope> Beavers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are we're, we're a big baseball family so we are really looking forward to baseball this year <laughs> great so um yeah and Donnie, uh we're we're coming kind of close to the wire so do okay. we wanna... well let me bring it home here okay so off okay. Well, let's oops share again okay so so I just want to say, this is really, as I promised, it was not going to be that long. I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, pest management. And there's a couple of issues I just want to draw to your attention. I don't think they're going to apply their, uh, as much to cherry. Uh, pest management situation during pollination is actually one of the best um, for cherry and pear, but uh, just, I wanna bring attention to this. You're gonna hear your beekeepers complain about fungicides. And what they're talking about is in almonds Andoni, a couple of years ago. And Donnie, you're in presenter view, just so you know. Thank you. So what, um, what, am I not, is it okay now? Yep, that looks better. Okay, so what, what uh, happened was um, the, uh, the bees kind of, uh, uh, they, they noticed this situation in almonds where the honeybees kind of came out halfway and then they stalled and they died. And it wasn't clear what the issue was. And this was, you know, uh, became a problem for the almond board. And there was some great work that was done. Uh, and it was a really kind of counterintuitive and I just want to make you aware of it. So here are some two in blue, we have two insect growth regulators, bee friendly products, you know, we recommend them for doing pest management uh, around bloom. And then we have three fungicides. Also, if you feed them to larvae, these are honeybee larvae. If you feed any of these five products to honeybee larvae, they develop regularly, no problem. But what happened was when they were tank mixing uh, Altacore um, with Tilt, they started to see this effect. And so the one thing I just want to, when beekeepers start to talk to you about, you know, fungicides and stuff, there is this real specific issue about tank mixing and we're you know, rec and I know you don't have a lot of insect problems uh, and may not be using these products at this time but I just wanted to make you aware of it because your beekeepers will ask you about it but just to go over sort of the best practices for uh, you know working with pollinators you know get your get your insecticides on before the bees arrive and then wait till petal fall and then start to do your remaining treatments and just be mindful that you're gonna start, it's gonna be later in the season. So you're gonna have wild plants blooming on the edge and you're gonna have flowering weeds. And so you're gonna have to deal with those. So if we go into a cherry orchard, the first thing you should do, if let's say you're in this situation. So you've got, you're this person here, your cherries are coming out of bloom. You wanna get your treatment on. This person has a later variety. They've got some mason bees in there. They've got their honeybees in there. First thing you ought to do, pick up the phone, call the beekeeper and just let them know that I've got to get a spray on. And um, beekeepers in the state of Oregon and Washington really want to work with you. This is uh, one of the episodes I had with Harry Vanderpool who says, you know, there's no easy money in agriculture and banging your fists on the table and pointing your fingers is it going to work. He wants to build bridges. So call your beekeeper up. Give them a fair amount of notice if you're going to be putting an insecticide spray on and maybe just give them a heads up or a text message if you're planning to put a fungicide on. And, you know, if it's a real problem, they can, they can come across the state and uh, with their forklift and move their bees out. Uh, but that is a lot of, you know, if you have built up good communication with your beekeeper in advance, something like this will go smooth. If you've had an antagonistic relationship with your beekeeper, this is just going to end up in antagonism more of it. Next thing is buffer that habitat. And so, you know, uh, you don't have a lot of room against your orchard edges. And so a lot of you have a situation like this where you've got uh, in, in, in um, uh, further east uh, um, where you've got balsam root and lupins and all sorts of things blooming up against uh, your edge. Uh, you know, 
in this situation, you know, on that last row, turn your nozzles off. Don't spray directly into this area. Last thing, the other thing I would say is as you're coming by the honeybee colonies, and I already talked about this, it's really worthwhile placing them back, giving them some buffer room. Don't, uh, don't try and push them right up against the crop if you have the option. And I really do think, especially if you're in cherry, you're not getting nearly the benefit you think by putting a pallet here and there. Put them in a nice hot spot up high with good air drainage. Those bees are going to come out and forage earlier and you're just not going to have any drift issues. Last thing is just mow everything down. Um, this is actually from Tim Daly's uh, orchard. A great job, is ready to you know get some sprays on, just mows that alley down. Last thing I did wanna quickly mention as well is we have been working with different industries on these things called bee protection protocols. This, we met with the Clover Commission recently and did this. It involves the extension agent. Here's Nicole Anderson, our clover seed extension agent crop consultants, uh, growers, commissioners, and you know uh, beekeepers. And we just sat around the room and just had an occasional every few years conversation about like what it looks like to have good pollination. And it resulted in this uh, great card where we've really specified out colony strength, you know, when bees can leave, when treatments go on. We talk about specific treatments that may be a, an irritant. And we go back and get uh, press to the clover industry, making sure that they get credit in places like Portland and Salem for the work that they're doing for stewardship. So something that you know cherry and pear industry in Oregon may consider doing, we'd love to work with you. Uh, Chris Ashley and I would you know uh, be thrilled to sort of work out and have like one of these. And it was really easy. It was like two, three conversations. And it turned out in a lot of the, these crops, the biggest irritant was like uh, irrigation pooling up around the colonies. It wasn't what anybody thought it was. So it just uh, smoothed everything out and it worked really well. Okay, and with that, I, I do wanna credit the Oregon Blueberry Commission. A lot of the work that I did here was uh, working with them, um, but I'm really excited now to be working uh, more closely with the cherry industry uh, with, uh, with Chris and Ashley. Um, and um, if you have any questions, there's my email and we'll try to bring some of the unanswered questions to next week's session. Oh, Ashley, you're muted. Thanks, Antoni. Just a reminder that if you're interested in getting Oregon pesticide credits for this meeting, please, please, please type in your full name as it appears on your pesticide license with your license number. I need to make sure that we get this. I need to make sure that if I'm audited by ODA, I have all the appropriate information. Um, so you have a couple more questions. Um, yes, you can get a copy of this meeting. So this presentation will be recorded. It's being recorded currently, and it will be uploaded loaded to the Oregon State University North Central uh, Extension Service YouTube, and I will send a link out to that. Um, Mike has a question here. It seems like retain is beneficial for a variety like Regina. Is there a temperature to look for where we might not need it? Yeah, it, I mean, it'd be worthwhile. Let me just quickly scroll back. I think that's the, I think, uh, Mike, you've hit it, uh, the nail on the head. It is a question of like flaky varieties. And if we look back at that study from WSU, let's just bring it up here again. So from the study from WSU, that temperature range was, it was, if I remember right, it was when you were getting uh, daily highs above 68. That's where you would see, you know, at below that temperature, uh, retain wasn't really giving you any benefit. It was at, you know, at that 68 and up uh, temperature uh, highs where uh, you were getting the benefit. And does anybody, oh, where do we put our names and our license number? So put your name and your license number into the chat box, please. If you are looking for ODA pesticide credits, does anybody have any other questions related to today's presentation? So um, all of these questions have been recorded and I'm currently compiling them into an email to send to our presenters today so that hopefully we can get uh, some, some more specific answers for some of them next week. And Anthony, can you talk a little bit about what we're going to have next week? Yeah, it's we're going to turn our attention to um, habitat, uh, just what Chris was talking about. And Chris is 
got some active projects looking at beneficial insects uh, that aren't bees. Um, but also we're going to talk about the work that we've been doing with Orchard View uh, and some of the findings we've had in terms of um, the, the bees that are, uh, the, 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 how that habitat, um, how those habitat um, programs work. And we're going to have somebody from NRCS as well. Uh, the Mid-Columbia region has a targeted program to put in pollinator and beneficial insect habitat. So you'll learn from NRCS how to access those programs. And this is a great time now to subscribe for those programs. Uh, and, and we'll talk about some of the great bees. I think one of the great success stories that you guys have, and I've talked to Mike about this previously, is you've got really for, you know, people think, oh, agriculture is like, it's incompatible with biodiversity. But the bee biodiversity that you have in those, um, you know, those fragments of habitat, those oak fragments, is really rich. It's a really good news story, I think, for the industry to let people know how amazing it is. And I think you'll learn about uh, what those bees are and where they are at. Um, and, um, and I think that can be rolled into some marketing down the, down the line. All right, well, thank all of our panelists for joining us today and thank everyone out there for uh, coming to our meetings. These have been really well attended and I'm always glad to have you. Thank you so much, Ashley, for hosting. For hosting us, you did a great job. Thanks guys, you have a good rest of your day. I'm gonna be collecting questions and uh, getting them to you soon. Thanks, Andoy. Bye-bye.